Hi everybody, this is Vintage Sewing Machine Garage and you will probably recognize this image. The last time I showed this machine to you, I had just sprayed it down with some WD-40. There are other products you can use and then I wrapped it in plastic. I got the lid put back on, put the plastic on and left it uh, under sh sheltered. It, it was not in danger of getting wet and uh, we've got warm weather now and I've been letting it sit for a few days now just uh, hoping that I'd get some um, some breaking up of this old grease that you guys saw. So I'm gonna <clears throat> take it out of its little bag here. It's a pretty heavy duty plastic bag. And I wanted to um, kind of go here. I'll turn it so you can see the hand wheel and see what it's doing. See if it's doing anything. I had barely been able to get it to wiggle. It's feeling a little bit, a little bit looser. Now, as I go forward, it's uh, it's it's resisting me, but it is turning. It's it's looser. I'm getting some movement. Now let's see if I can turn it up a different way for you. So you can see in the side door here, and of course here's the take up arm. I'll see if I can get my arms down here. I want you to see we're getting movement and you can see hopefully some of this mechanism in here. I've got some pretty good sunlight out today. Let's zoom in. Try to hold the machine still. It's kind of an awkward angle here. And let's see. Okay, you guys should be able to see. You see the needle bar moving and you see the mechanism behind all this linkage near the take-up arm that's actually moving. So that's that's a good sign. We're getting some movement here. Now that's vertical movement. <clears throat> and you'll notice that in any machine that has zigzag capability, which this one does, it has a lot of uh, more capability even. Uh, I haven't tried the zigzag yet, so I'm going to take the machine inside and we're, uh, I'm, I'm anxious to uh, see if we can go underneath the machine. We'll take the bottom panel off and see what we find. Hopefully there's not too much of this thick grease, or maybe there's none of it down there. I, I have no idea, but we're, we're going to find out. Okay, so we're back inside now, and I'm going to do what I did the other day when I was first looking at the machine, I'm going to go ahead and get the top removed. And what I'm hoping for here is that I've gotten, hopefully, some of this grease dissolved. Now, visually, it's going to look very much the same. I still see grease stains in there, but clearly I've gotten some movement. So it looks like the WD-40 did help in this regard. But <clears throat> if I... If I go, you, you folks saw me spray some of that uh, WD-40 on the metal linkages behind the dial. Remember I was telling you that plastic dials are perfectly fine, but you never want to force them when the metal that they are attached to is frozen because the plastic will give way first and you'll ruin it, uh, break it, and then <clears throat> you have more problems than you had to start with. So, if you look over here, I'm still having issues with my pressure bar raising it up, although it did come up a little bit more easily. Uh, if you look here, <clears throat> this is the stitch width regulator. And right now it is set to zero. So if I want to change that, I need to turn this outer dial. And it's not moving. It's very, it's like moving it through molasses or mud. And I'm just, I'm not going to push it. I could, but there's a linkage up top that this connects to. And as the linkage turns, um, you can set the width and there's an adjustment inside the machine uh, drive chain that allows the needle to move side to side. One of the things you'll find, again, is that machines that have more than a straight stitch, uh, obviously the straight stitch function itself can be frozen as this one was before I sprayed it down. But you may also discover that the zigzag or any other feature, this machine has a number of decorative stitches as well, that feature is usually uh, <clears throat> it, it can still be frozen. In other words, getting that unfrozen is usually more time uh, consuming or there's more to that than simply getting the needle to move up and down. 
Uh, so that lateral movement is one of the things we need to, to work on. But before I do that, I'm curious to get underneath and see what we've got. Now, for those of you who have never um, taken the bottom pan off of one of these Kenmores, I wanted to, I'm going to point out to you which screws, because you see a bunch of screws here, but only certain ones come apart. I'm going to show that to you. And if you look at this, you know, the good news is at least there is a way to take it off. Because if I were to show you, which I will right now, this is the bottom of my Singer 301 that I was just making another video on. Let's turn the camera over so you can see that. Now, many uh, vintage sewing machines from this era, this is circa 1950, 51, they don't have any drain uh, bottom pans at all. And having a pan was not always useful for some of the earlier machines because they were often in sewing tables. And those sewing tables, you'll see this when I do the video on the tables, a lot of them have a sort of a catch board that would catch things like needles and thread and oil. But this particular Singer 301 was often carried in a case and it was considered a portable. And so with that one screw, you just saw me unscrew that one screw, the pan comes right out. I have access to the whole undercarriage of the machine. This one, of course, has an old, <laughs> an old felt that's soaked with oil and that'll be replaced as part of its restoration. But I showed you this because uh, if this had not been a portable, it, it might not have even had a drip pan. So there's nothing wrong with a drip pan. It can be quite uh, practical to catch oil. If you were taking this machine to a friend's or to a quilting, you certainly did not want to have to oil your machine and get oil and who knows what all over your neighbor's floor or carpet or rug, I should say. But <clears throat> uh, the problem here, and you see this, this again, this Kenmore, excuse me, is um, we're talking 1970s. And now look, they, they put tons of uh, these access screws on here. And I'm gonna to point to these to let you know which ones we're going to unscrew. This applies to most, if not all, most Kenmore uh, 158.19 um, 1900 series machines that have the free arm, uh, the 1941, the 1942 models. So look, if you look here, I can tell you immediately which screws you don't want to touch. Surrounding these screws is a little rubber um, foot. Uh, there's actually one missing here. Uh, and then over here on the far end you have another one. Those rubber feet have screws, but they have these are actually the, the, the base of the support legs for the machine, and they are not attached to this little tray, and you'll see that when I unscrew it. So I'm going to get up my trusty, you guys have heard me in my tool video talk about my, my trusty Chapman um, screwdriver set. Uh, I, can, I think of all the tools I have, I use this one the most. I really recommend doing it. It helps prevent stripping of screws. We've all used universal screwdrivers before. I was using this one. You know, this is a classic one that we've all used. It's tapered, uh, but it, it's, it's not as gentle on screws. Uh, I was using it as a lever just to open the top before. But it's not as gentle on screws as these um, uh, screwdriver bits are. These things are designed to fit flush with the screw. So I'm going to get my ratchet out here. And what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to hit several screws. There's this one, this one, this one, and then there are two over here on the free arm section. Um, not this one here in the center. That is not part of what we're going to remove, and you'll see that. First thing I notice is that the screws are not snug, which is a surprise, but that tells me someone has been in here before. Sometimes you'll get a machine, and I swear they have, it's never been, no one has ever opened it since 1975 when it was, you know, shipped from Japan. But um, this one is, the screws are, I'm not even needing the ratchet now, the screws are very, um, I mean, they weren't about to fall out or anything, but, um, I mean, it could be a good sign. It could mean that someone has serviced the machine. Uh, 
One thing to remember, when you, because we've got metal screws and a plastic tray, um, this is important taking these out and especially when we put them back in, because it's going to rest against a piece of plastic, you want to be extra careful and extra gentle and not do not over tighten or torque these screws down because if you do, uh, you could crack the plastic. Uh, and if that's ever happened to you, you know, that's it kind of, uh, it's not pleasant when you know you've You've actually damaged your own your own possession there. Now, if I remember correctly, and I do, um, one thing to note is when you take these screws off, you're going to take a total of four of these shorter screws, and then there's one long screw that goes in the very far uh, uh, end of the free arm. Make sure that you remember that because some of you might try to put the long screw in one of these holes and it won't go. Um, now, I'm going to zoom in here because there's something I want to show you while we're doing this. I have serviced quite a few of these models before, and one of the things that's a little tricky, I'm not sure why they did this, but something to be aware of. When I've taken the screws off and it's, and it's loose, but I'm going to zoom in and let you see something. Right here is the, this is the right side of the little door. If you remember when I was taking that convertible piece off before, this is the door that swings open so you can get access to your bobbin. Well, right next to it <clears throat> is the edge of the pan we're going to take off. And there's a little notch. There's a notch in the plastic here. You can possibly see it. This particular one is not uh, fighting with me, but there are times, I'm going to turn it this way, I really want you to see this, see if that's going to come up, yeah, I think that'll show up good, all right, right here, right here where my finger is, you want to be extra careful because when you take this off, when you take the, the drip pan off, there are times when it won't come off, you'll feel it loose, and you'll feel it loosen, but it won't come off and it seems to be fighting with you. Be very careful because right here, a lot of times it will hang up on you. It might help you if you pull back your little door to see the edge, but it's right here. And it's, it's actually sitting right there. If I can get out of the way with my thumb there, let's zoom in a little bit. This right here, guys, there's a notch, there's, there's the machine, this is metal where my thumb is, and then right over here and just below it is a notch with plastic. It's part of the, part of the pan, and let me pull this back and you'll see. Now, this one came off fine. Sometimes this notch will hang, and it, will, it, will ha it won't let go like a dog with a, you know, with a toy in its mouth, and you want to be extra careful. And the way you do that is, as you loosen this, you want to turn it and you'll, it's one of those things I can't, this one is not fighting me, so it's kind of difficult to show. But you, what you want to do is gently move this down, but if it, you know, you, you have to kind of work with it. Uh, it's kind of a dance. If you don't do that, you can end up breaking, here it is, this is the little piece I'm referring to. You don't want to break that. Uh, this one has, actually has a slight, it looks like it has a slight notch where someone may have notched it. So that was kind of a design issue with Marus and the company that made this. Now let's take a look at our pan, see what we've got here. And what we have is, unfortunately, what looks like grease. I wouldn't call this a lot of grease, but this is the same thick grease that I was talking about on the machine. And apparently it's, uh, it's either dripped down from above, we'll look in a minute, and, and it looks like also, <laughs> Someone, whoever was in here before, ended up leaving a piece of um, a piece of cloth. It feels like a little bit, some sort of flannel or something. I don't know. I don't know if they had it in here as something to, to catch grease. Um, I felt it pull a little bit over here in the plug area. Maybe they were trying to, maybe they were trying to uh, protect the plug. I don't know. You know, the, uh, to, you know, that you could paraphrase the uh, Forrest Gump. You, you really don't know what you're going to get sometimes. But uh, anyway, the pan itself does not appear to be cracked, and that's nice. Sometimes you'll see cracks over here, but it's not a big deal. Again, you, know, you all know I talk a lot about the importance of steel machines, and this machine, its mechanicals are all steel. 
if the drip pan is plastic, it's not a big deal. It's not a uh, it's not a real stress point on the machine. And so uh, the you know the old singer that you saw, of course, that was steel. That was metal. But uh, I, I don't mind that so much. It's when they started making plastic gears that I became increasingly unhappy with new machines. Okay, now the moment we've all been wondering. Let's take a look. I'm going to zoom in here for you, and let's see what's in here. And unfortunately, <laughs> whoever put this strange lubricant in the machine apparently also went underneath and did it too. Um, I see thick molasses-like goop here. I see it in here. Uh, there's a strange amount of it over here, and I'm not even sure why they did that. Here, you can see it. You can see it better there. Um, now, if I pan over the rest of the machine here, it, I see some, but I don't see a lot. It looks like they put some in a moving part here, but at least they didn't spray the whole thing with it. This isn't so bad. This little notch here, and uh, well, this is this is a huge surprise, guys. I'm going to show you this. Let me pan back out just a bit. This machine has, like many machines, a feed dog lowering mechanism. And when I turn, I was very slow and careful. I was expecting this not to turn at all. Let's uh, get up there a little bit more so you can see what I'm doing. You see my finger and I'm pushing on this little lever. It's attached to steel, but again, you can see, look below the metal rod that this plastic is attached to. The plastic uh, knob is okay, but this is, a, again, another place. Never force this. These are often frozen because they weren't used. If you ever get one of these and you see this lever and you're not sure what it does and you go to move it and it doesn't move, stop right there. You know, you don't want to damage it until you've had a chance to investigate. But I was surprised it moves. And if you look at the little, uh, looks like a little torpedo here. It's actually going, so that, uh, strangely, is okay, and that's, that's a good thing. Now, over here, this little area is a, is a space, there's a little grease pack in here. I, I don't know if they changed this, that's the least of our problems. That actually is supposed to have grease because there's a gear there. So at least we, we, may, we may have grease in, at least in one place that's correct. Now, uh, let's pan back out just a bit, and let's come over on this side. now. I'm going to get my flashlight and see what we can see. Right now, I'm seeing an awful lot of thick, uh, dark grease, and it looks like someone went to town and kept spraying. They sprayed in places they, I don't even know if they knew where they were spraying. Okay, I've got my light. I'm shining in here, and what am I looking for? Well, the first thing I see is my belt, and that belt is awfully shiny, and that makes me unhappy because I suspect that whoever put grease in here thought it would be smart to put grease on the belt. That is the last place you ever want to see grease, folks. Grease on a belt is not cool. It is not a good idea. Um, now, I'm not seeing any on the sides of the motor, thank God. I was worried that somebody had done that and they would have really harmed the motor. So far, I think they left the motor alone. Um, I cannot tell. Notice when I turn this, the, the motor pulley is moving. Now, if I get any slippage on the belt, it could just be that the belt needs adjusting, or it could be that somebody put grease on the belt, and that's, that's really unfortunate. Belts are cheap. They're not expensive, but if the belt's in good shape, you know, wow. But I'll take a little further look. I'm going to be going inside and looking at it to see if, in fact, I'm going to need to um, make sure I didn't have the flashlight in your way so you could actually see what I was seeing. Um, but of course, this is where it connects to the pulley. This machine has two belts. It has a reduction pulley, uh, which is a bit of a copy or a knockoff of Bernina's um, motor belt design. But what else do I see? I'm just seeing a lot of this heavy grease here. And unfortunately, uh, they use the same thing down here. Now, I am going to uh, need to take a look further at that zigzag mechanism, because I really want to get it moving, at least have some movement in it before I start using that knob to adjust the stitch width. Got to be really careful with those knobs. They've, they've survived since the 70s, and they'll be just fine going forward as long as we're not overly rough on the machine uh, as a result of trying to get it unlocked. 
So that's what the underside looks like. Uh, let's take a look. I want you to see um, the pieces that are really integral to the zigzag stitch. If I come over here and I touch, this is that stitch with button or dial. And I'm going to put the screwdriver here. And I'd like you to see the part on the machine that is going to be needing to move when the zigzag is functioning properly. And of course, all of the uh, specialty decorative stitches are going to rely on this as well. So over my right hand, my fingers, I've got my hands on that dial. That's again the stitch width regulator. And if I start to turn it, I don't know if you guys can see, but this little lever right here where the screwdriver is pointing at, watch it move. I don't know if you can tell, it's moving slightly, right? But it's not moving that well. And I'm not going to tax this, this uh, plastic dial over here because it's not ready to move yet. What does that tell me? It tells me I'm going to have to go back to where this linkage is, connects, linkages, linkage connects. Um, it, is, it is bound between different uh, uh, riveted areas in here. I'm going to apply more of the lubrication here and then I'm also going to focus, I'm going to be focusing in this area right here. Right next to, it's sort of an offshoot of the actual needle bar. There's a little bar here and this bar, uh, the, there's a mechanism that slides here and that is what allows the zigzag to work. Don't know if that's showing up for you. I'll try to zoom just a little bit more. But again, um, it sits right right there. And that's a place that you want to put both cleaner if it's full of old grease and oil. And then that's a, a particular area that you're going to want to apply sewing machine oil when you're getting to relubricate the machine. Because the zigzag uses that just as much as the um, as the, uh, the, uh, the straight stitch does for up and down motion. So now, as you can see, I have discovered, uh, I was hoping that the underside of the machine would not have this grease, but it does. Now, once again, as I mentioned early on, uh, or in the last video, the machine's not broken. It was just either not maintenance, or in this case, uh, maintained very poorly, uh, given the wrong thing. So I am going to uh, make another plan for, again, touching the, uh, the area I mentioned here, and then over here, and we'll see if we can get the zigzag to work. Once I know I start getting a zigzag, and it'll be intermittent for a while until it kind of warms up, once that starts working, then I can focus on working on the rest of the machine, and then I'm gonna to have to check out the belt to see if the belt is in fact covered with grease. If it is, I've gotta get it off of there. If not, <clears throat> if no grease is on the pulley and the belt is not greased, then I may or may not be able to utilize that belt but I definitely want to check it for you know things like tension, make sure that the belt is working properly. And then I can start investigating these other options. So you can see here, the, the machine was designed for regular stitching, uh, as well as over here where it says modifier for uh, stretch stitches. But this machine is nowhere ready to try stretch stitches yet. First, we've got to get the regular stitching working again. And um, this little controller here that controls stitch length when I try to move it, it moves sort of, kind of, but it is again like the rest of the machine, still stiff. So I guess the good news is, uh, you know, putting putting the WD-40 solvent-based product on here has able has allowed this to to uh, to to dissolve some of that old grease. Uh, as a reminder, again, that WD-40 is not a lubricant; it is not oil. That's not what's you know. It's cleaning some of this old grease and allowing me to move the machine. But you don't want to use that as an oil for your machine. It doesn't last. It's not really a lubricant so much as it is a cleaner. It's also good. You know, you you may have used it to unfreeze rusted bolts. It's good at unfreezing things, but we still are going to have to completely and properly lubricate and oil this machine. But anyway, uh, this was installment two, and. Uh, the machine, you know, I still have hope for it. I can tell that it's going to be a bit of a road, but it's not the first time I've come across a machine like this. And hopefully those of you who are new to this will not be. I don't want you to see this as discouraging because most sewing machine restorations are nothing like this. Most of what I do on machines is, um, 
you know, I check out their foot pedals like with a 301 and I have, I spend hours cleaning them and re-oiling them and adjusting them. But occasionally, it's very rare, but I get a machine like this that is, uh, looks like a hopeless case, but I have rescued other machines that were in worse shape. And once they finally got stabilized, they would sew as wonderfully as any other machine. And so, uh, again, don't give up if you're, if you ever in one of these situations. And so what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll go back with, uh, strategically a little bit more WD-40. I'm going to go underneath and then, uh, we'll see how it turns out. I, I make no promises on this one, but I'm determined to try. And, uh, that's the whole point of the video is to encourage those of you who have a machine and it might frustrate you. Um, you know, don't give up. There are, there are ways to, to, uh, bring a machine back. And sometimes you have to stop for a while. Maybe you go online and research a little bit more and figure out how to do it and tackle different sections of the machine, right? Because there are certain areas of a machine that, that you want to check. We just looked underneath. So it looks like this series is going to be a little longer than I originally thought, but you never know. Uh, but obviously for those of you who really love the use of these machines, um, I think it's worth it, you know, and, and if you bring a machine like this back, it's, it's pretty rewarding when you realize it may have, you may have taken a lot of hours or not to, to do it, but now it's working again. And you've not only have you saved it from a dumpster, uh, you've got a really high quality piece of, uh, engineering and they just don't, they literally don't make them like that anymore. So I so appreciate all of you watching and hanging in there with me as, as I, uh, struggle with the Kenmore here and, because I, I often uh, in my videos make things look simple and easy. I'm, I intentionally wanted you folks to see this and to see that even people who've restored many sewing machines, sometimes we have to, to struggle and fight to save them, but I think it's worth it. Anyway, feel free to subscribe and uh, any comments you have or any of your own uh, uh, stories of saving a machine, feel free to list them in the comments. Thank you.